Morning everybody, it's Thursday, it's the winter 2021, it is GIGU Pathology Day. Specifically today we're going to talk about indirect inguinal hernias, which are difficult to understand, so we're going to do a little embryology of the region so you understand them. And yep, this is part one of part two, and off we go, it's week nine Thursday, I said winter 2021. And here's just a general thing. You should definitely know these different types of hernias. I'm not going to, I don't have time to get into all of these, uh, but these are the run of the mill hernias. We have groin hernias, which include femoral hernia here, an indirect inguinal hernia, usually can be palpated here, and a direct inguinal hernia, which is a hernia through Hasselbeck's triangle, or the febrile triangle, or I'm sorry, the inguinal triangle. There's umbilical hernias. There's epigastric hernias down below the xiphoid. There is inc incisional hernias that occur. Here's a better picture of one that can occur at a at an old operation site, like an an appendectomy, cholecystitis for a gallbladder removal. And a spigelian hernia occurs right in the linea alba. Just curious. Let me see if my markers are working. Yep. Remember the kind of the lateral border, rectus abdominis, linea semilunaris, that's where spigelian hernia occurs. I do like those hernias. All right, let's talk about groin hernias. Remember from last time we just started, the groin region is right there where uh, where the thigh meets the the kind of the lower part of the pelvis, that's the groin. It's officially defined as the region occupied by the inguinal rig ligament. So it's between the ASIS, the anterior superior leg spine, and the pubic tubercle. Groin hernia is a general term, and there's two types of hernias underneath that. Remember, groin hernia is itself a member of the giant category, abdominal wall hernia. So groin hernia is made up of two types of hernia inguinal hernias and femoral hernias. Inguinal hernias are super common, uh, but they're further subdivided into indirect inguinal hernias and direct inguinal hernias. Got it? So very important slide. Those of you who ask, what do I study? I don't know what to study. This needs to be memorized right here. Right? Memorize this. And groin hernia is under the category of abdominal wall hernia. All right, let's get into the inguinal hernias. Again, there's two types, indirect and direct. Uh, some authors call indirect hernias congenital hernias, so watch out for that, netter, a.k.a., and direct inguinal hernias are acquired hernias. Okay, the most common of all the abdominal, the giant category, abdominal wall hernia, of all these categories, of all the hernias, Spigelian hernia, umbilical hernia, uh, these are the most common of all of them. And, the, and if you want to go even deeper, it's the indirect inguinal hernia. That's the champ. If you're going to have a hernia, it's probably going to be an indirect inguinal hernia, male or female. And it occurs when small bowel gets sucked down into a embryological defect that goes through the through the inguinal canal and we'll look at that defect as well uh, here in a second um, and in general inguinal hernias well that was a that was an indirect inguinal hernia just occurred uh, it because in general we're so if I say in general we're talking about direct and indirect inguinal hernias so uh, but small bowel either gets sucked through that embryological hole or just a t tissue weakening, uh, specifically in Hesselbach's triangle. Right here is a, you're, this is a P to A view. You're looking, if uh, you cleaned out all the intestines and you were inside the abdominal cavity looking out, um, you would see the rectus abdominis with the rectus sheath removed. Uh, the linea semilunaris would be a tendon right here. That makes up the medial wall of the inguinal triangle or Hasselbeck's triangle. There's the inguinal ligament, makes up the 
inferior part of the triangle. And there's your inferior epigastric vessels, artery and vein, that makes up the kind of lateral superior wall and makes up a triangle. This is where direct inguinal hernias occur. Indirect inguinal hernias occur through the deep inguinal ring here. All right, so that's pertinent anatomy of the area. What about the epidemiology of these hernias, inguinal hernias in general? Didn't we start? I thought we started indirect, did we? No, we're just still in general. All right, uh, so the, they're, again, they're the most common abdominal wall hernia. How common are they? 75% of all abdominal wall hernias uh, will occur. So that's a big chunk of the pie of all the abdominal wall hernias, spigelian hernia, umbilical hernia, epigastric hernia. 75% of them occur in the inguinal region. The lifetime risk of uh, all humans is about 27% in men and 3% in women. They don't occur in women as much. The prevalence of inguinal hernia in someone over 75 years is almost 50%. It's 45%. So these are very common in older people. Here's a newborn who's got a, you could say that's an abdominal wall hernia. If you want to go deeper, you could say that's an inguinal hernia. If you want to go deeper, it's a direct inguinal hernia. Sometimes a surgeon has to figure that out, but you can usually tell by, by looking. Uh, remember the locations. If we go back to the locations, let's look at these real quick. The direct inguinal hernia is usually above the uh, kind of the crack of the where the thigh meets the abdominal cavity, so above the inguinal ligament. Indirect inguinal hernias are right on or, or even just a hair below the inguinal ligament. All right, um, some more epidemiology. 30% of patients are completely asymptomatic. They don't even know it's there. <clears throat> Maybe they just discover it one day when they're sitting on the toilet straining and uh, they're looking down there and they can see it bulge out. Inguinal hernia surgical repair is one of the most common surgeries performed in the United States. 20 million inguinal hernia repairs are done every year. 15% of patients suffer a recurrence after that. That's a huge reoccurrent rate, so sometimes needs to be redone. And yeah, intestines and peritoneal fluid can get into the scrotum in men. So here we have a double hernia, right? There's above the inguinal. So this newborn's got all sorts of problems. They have a, they, they have it looks like a direct inguinal hernia here, and they have intestine and fluid down in here. So indirect and direct going on in this little, uh, this little dude. Uh, I should have warned you about that. Guinness Book of World Records. There's the largest inguinal hernia on record. Uh, this was reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, so it's not fake. It's not photoshopped. <clears throat> Over the years, this uh, this hernia was huge, and they recommended it be removed, and he refused, didn't believe in surgery. And it got bigger. For a second time, they recommended it's getting pain in it and digestive problems that he didn't do it. Third time he went in like this and they said it's too dangerous. All your intestines are have grown down in here and it's just too intense. He's got to live like this the rest of his life because he didn't want to do something about it. <clears throat> hernia risk factors. What increases the chances if you want an inguinal hernia? What do you got to do to get one of these things? Uh, and why? Well, one risk factor is just the human. The there is a kind of genetic weakness of the lower abdominal wall I in humans, and why? Well, why is that? Evolution is believed that we haven't been upright. Uh, we used to be more kind of like an animal, more on using four legs. We haven't been upright is one of the theories, and therefore there was no reason to embryologically or evolutionarily speaking, develop the lower abdomen. Uh, <clears throat> and then there's this darn, this processus vaginalis, the way that the testicles descended in humans, and in females for that matter, 
females don't have testicles, but they still had a process as vaginalis. Only it pulled the round ligament down and not the testes. Um, so we'll look at this, but it's 25% of, of, of people. So some of you listening to this right now, you have a process, a persistent or an open process as vaginalis. And it may be completely open or a little bit open, but you, you have a little bit of peritoneal fluid in your testes right now. It might be just a little bit and you don't even notice it. We'll get into that. Uh, then increased, another risk is increased ab intra-abdominal pressure <coughs> is a well-known cause of this. And what causes increased intra-abdominal pressure? Chronic cough, like people with COPD. Anybody who's coughing all the time. Uh, obesity is, is interesting. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but... In general, for for abdominal wall hernias, obesity does increase the intra-abdominal pressure. So a spigelian hernia or uh, an umbilical hernia increases the risk for those. Interestingly, obesity doesn't increase the risk for the indirect inguinal hernia, which is kind of strange. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about indirect inguinal hernias. Uh, people who are chronically constipated and always pushing down and straining, that can start to push intestine through, either through Hesselbeck's triangle or, uh, or anywhere really, for that matter. <coughs> people with C, uh, with um, who have problems with their urinary outflow tract, like their urethra, they have stenosis of the urethra, uh, or they have, or they have. Uh, let's see, what else can I think of? Um, BA, oh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia uh, for guys. Anything that blocks urination and you have to push down hard to, to, help, uh, to help urinate, that can do it. Heavy lifting occupations, guys, furniture movers are lifting heavy all the time. People who are throwing up all the time. Bulimics, people who get pregnant to have a lot of kids can end up having hernias. I have one daughter who has had trouble with that. Age is a risk factor. Yep, as we already looked under incidence, it greatly increases. Remember, almost 50% of people, of really old people, have these things. And that's because of degeneration. All the tissue dries out and gets brittle deep in the deep inguinal ring and the lower abdominal wall. So it makes it easier to push intestine out through there. Being male is a risk factor. There's George of the Jungle, if you don't know who that is, an old character. Um, about 90% of all inguinal hernia repairs are in men. So what's the story with that? Uh, why? Well, yeah, what is the story with that? Well, it's really the descending of the testicles that is the problem. So when the testes are pulled down through the abdominal wall into the scrotum, as we'll see, uh, you have an inguinal canal, and the inguinal canal is stretched way out by the descent of the testes. Uh, in females, all that has to be pulled down is the round ligament. So that's not very, that's skinny. It's like a pencil. Uh, rather, I mean, tes testicles are much bigger than that. So you stretch that tissue out to begin with. So that's thought to be the difference. Uh, familial, there is an, uh, some evidence that shows these are genetic related, like almost everything is. Uh, but there's one kind of fly in the ointment, if you will. There's a very well designed twin study that actually did not find an increased risk. So that's still a little questionable whether or not genetics has anything to do with these things. Occupation, definitely medium to high physical, uh, physical demanding jobs. Uh, like construction or a dock worker who's lifting heavy all the time, they have an increased risk for these. Uh, males tend to be more involved in these activities than females as well, so that might also add to the gender deal. So let's look at obesity. I said we're going to look at this a little more. <laughs> There's a uh, fried donuts. Um, yeah, you want to get obese, so they eat these every day. But surprisingly, with regard to inguinal hernias only, direct and indirect, 
obesity is protective. So that's a great board one right there, right? Great, my question as well. Because obesity increases the risk for umbilical hernias and spigelian hernias, epigastric hernias, but not for, and femoral hernias even, but not for, uh, not for inguinal hernias. And it's thought that fat shields the lower abdominal wall and it can even plug the deep inguinal ring if you have a persistent uh, processus vaginalis. Uh, it can get into the hole a little bit and plug that so intestine can't move into it. So that's kind of the story there. What about other conditions? The connective tissue diseases, Marfan's, Ellis Danlers, Louis Dietz, neurofibromatosis, uh, they all carry increased risk for the development of inguinal hernia because all of your body tissue it just isn't as strong as normal people's. Like Gellos Daniels, five times the risk of, for developing uh, a inguinal hernia, and Marfan syndrome patients, a threefold risk. So those are significant risks. Um, and interestingly, patients who end up having an aortic aneurysm, uh, they are at high risk for also getting a inguinal hernia, and they probably have some undiagnosed connective tissue or mixed connective tissue disorder. We said uh, BPH, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, or hypertrophy, whichever way you want to go with that word. Three to four increased risk. Uh, smoking does not alter the risk. Uh, so that's another, another item. So we have obesity and smoking. I always put that question on the test for those of you who are actually listening to this. And, and people miss it. It just amazes me. I, I give you the answer. But smoking and obesity do not increase the risk for an inguinal hernia. Uh, COPD, we already said that one. Uh, coughing, uh, 2.5 time risk. How do these present? And remember, many of these are asymptomatic, and so you might not catch these for years. Uh, but typically, they finally notice a, a, a bulge sticking out, either at the inguinal ligament or below the inguinal ligament may or may not present all the time. Sometimes you're on the toilet straining and you can see it pop out. Uh, especially in children, they may, uh, when they're, if they get constipated, they may get scared when they see it. And so it may not be there all the time. Could extend into the scrotum of, of boys. Boys could get fluid in there. We'll talk about that. Uh, now, so where does it go in girls? The intestines can go all the way down into the scrotum of males, but where does it go in girls? Because they don't have a scrotum, right? So it goes to the labia majora. So it really can't go that far. So they don't have as much trouble with this. Although I'll show you a picture. They, they certainly can get, uh, they can get inguinal hernias. What is the differential diagnosis for a bulge down there in the inguinal region? Well, the cancerous mass in the testicle, if it's indirect inguinal hernia and it's down into the testicle. How do you know the cancer? It's not a testicle that's filled up with cancer. So that's a, a differential diagnosis. Uh, we have, I always say this word correct, crypt orc like stork. Adism, crypt orchidism is an undescended testicle. Well, how in the heck of that? Wouldn't it t the scrotum look smaller if it's only got one testicle? Yeah, but it makes that one testicle looks it looks strange it looks like it's more pronounced and so it looks like you have one big testicle and you don't realize you have one missing testicle so that can look like it as well uh, a lymph node in the region there are inguinal lymph nodes so those can commonly uh, they can occur right in the same spot where an indirect inguinal hernia would occur and then hydroseal sometimes it's impossible to tell the difference between a hydroseal which we'll get into next time which is fluid in the testicles or fluid at the labia majora. Sometimes you don't know if it's without grabbing and squishing it. Uh, you can't tell the difference. So hydrocele is another differential diagnosis. So now let's get right into these indirect inguinal hernias. Uh, we got to do this. This is always confusing. I didn't have time to do this in embryology. So uh, we'll go over this story of the testicular descent. Glubernaculum first. So the two terms that you need to memorize, and you need to memorize them right now. Glubernaculum, 
processus vaginalis, processus vaginalis and glubernaculum. These are the stars of the show when it comes to forming uh, the descending the testicles and forming the inguinal canal for that matter for females and then descending the round ligament. So the testicles, embryologically speaking, uh, they're up, they're extra peritoneal, they're in the posterior abdominal wall, way up about the level of T10. And so they're just below the diaphragm is where the where these tissues form from primordial tissue. And then on the bottom of the testicles, this glubernaculum occurs. Um, I think it's kind of like the testicles like Spider-Man and the glubernaculum is like the web he's going to shoot. And he's going to shoot this web all the way down to the very inferior part of the pelvic cavity. It's going to not go into the peritoneal cavity, though. He's going to be an extra peritoneal structure. And do I have a picture? Yes, I do. So the testicles form up here. The round ligament forms up here. And you have this Spider-Man-like tissue, and it shoots a web uh, extra peritoneally. This author didn't wasn't very good at at drawing that. So the peritoneum the, the should have been more like this. Right? So that's the only problem with that cuz this is an extra peritoneal structure. There's the peritoneal cavity. All right? But the glubernaculum uh, it goes all the way down here. Let me go back to my laser pointer. And it attaches where the scrotum is going to be or where the inguinal canal. This is the future inguinal canal region right there. And then it starts shortening. And it starts dragging the testes down behind the peritoneal cavity uh, until it gets all the way down here. And if you're female, that's where the round ligament will be dragged all the way down there as well. All right. So glubernaculum. Uh, uh, forms more of some primordial tissue at the bottom of the testes and then it grows like crazy how it knows where to grow who who knows and that's not well understood but that's the way it is and this is shortened and contracted and the testes are dragged they do go around the symphys pubis as well but they're outside the cavity because these would in this author's drawing this would be coming out of the plane of the page and sitting outside the peritoneal cavity I think that's the way they said to do it. Now we have a processus vaginalis which is also going to kind of the st second star of the show. So we got the testes sitting down here. Glubernaculum is still functioning. But then we get this this weird outpouching. So let me redraw the peritoneal cavity. Just uh, And what happens is you get an outpouching of parietal peritoneum. And then the glubernaculum follows it down. And then you have the skin of the scrotum would be growing right here. Uh, and this weird outpouching of the peritoneal cavity occurs all the way down to the bottom of the scrotum. And it pushes and makes the scrotum. And then it's controversial whether this, uh, this process is vaginalis pulls the testes down or whether the glubernaculum gets activated and starts going goes down first and then pulls this down second and we don't know for sure how that works but the two end up so you end up with a testicle right down here gubernaculum disappears um, and then you have this big let's let's just draw it like this so you have an extension of the peritoneal cavity all the way into the testes well then what's going to happen is we're going to dry this up and get rid of that because we don't want it peritoneal cavity way down here um, but guess what in some people it never dries up and that's a persistent process of vaginalis and those people can have peritoneal fluid flowing into their testicle so I just got way ahead of my slides but that's exactly where we're going all right so process of vaginalis uh, is a invagination or a herniation if you will or a diverticulum of parietal peritoneum and it pushes it down into the anterior inferior abdominal cavity, just like I drew. And it occurs immediately anterior to the glubernaculum, which I just said. And as it pushes down, 
it takes all the layers of the domino wall with it. And so as the testes goes down, it also takes all the layers of the abdominal wall, except it doesn't take that parietal peritoneal layer down with it. Right? I shouldn't say all the layers because there's one, the transverse abdominis fascia is not taken with it. Uh, so those layers aren't around the testes or in the inguinal canal for that matter. But yeah, so soon the processes vaginalis and the glubernaculum make it all the way into the new scrotum. Um, so here's a, a better diagram of this. Um, so we have the, in this case, the author thought that the testes slagged behind, but there's the glubernaculum, an, a herniation of, of the peritoneal cavity. And that eventually is going to go all the way down to here. And maybe this will start contracting now and start pulling and dragging the testes with it. But make sure the key point here is if we make the parietal peritoneum, or peritoneum, tomatoes, tomatoes, let's make that parietal peritoneal layer. Notice how the glubernaculum and the testes are going to be behind that. Right, so they're extra peritoneal structure. Everybody understand that? And then this whole setup just continues down into here. Got it? All right, so usually about week 32 of fetal development, the testes are pulled down. And everything I just said, the glubernaculum may shorten and help pull them down. It may be the descent of the processus vaginalis, a.k.a. is vaginal process. I should have said that. Vaginal process, the words, you know how in anatomy they can twist words around. Um, increasing intra-abdominal pressure from the intestines developing and growing is thought to maybe aid in this process to help kind of force it down. Uh, but here's the final, the final product, so I don't need to draw this again. Uh, but yeah, so there's... The testes has descended in the female. This would only go about, oh, about down to here. To, well, it would go to the, the mons pubis region. But yeah, so at this stage, we have a complete opening still. The processus vaginalis is still completely open. But soon, that's going to scar shut uh, in most, about 75% of humans, that'll scar shut. But it doesn't scar shut here. So that's going to become the cavity for the tunica vaginalis. Remember we studied that in, uh, in was it gross 2? Yeah, it was in gross 2 we studied that. Uh, the tunica vaginalis, the parietal and the visceral layers of the tunica vaginalis. And um, I don't think that they talked much about this cavity, but that's really important. The cavity for the process is vaginalis. That's where a hydrocele occurs, as we'll talk about. Okay, I think we got that. Uh, so goodbye to the processus vaginalis. As I said before, it degenerates. Sometimes it uh, takes a while to disintegrate, maybe even after birth. Uh, but that cord dries up except for the distal part. Remember I said this part right here is what, what dries up. This all dries up and seals shut. So you don't have, you don't want your peritoneal fluid leaking down there. But this never shows up and that becomes the tunica vaginalis cavity or the cavity for the tunica vaginalis. Alright, uh, and that and that distal part, it, it doesn't completely surround the testes either. Uh, it covers the front and the sides of the testes but not the back of the testes. So, you if this is if this is scarred up and clogged up, we kind of have, even though this is the cavity for the tunica vaginalis, but it's kind of like a peritoneal cavity, right? Because embryologically, that cavity for the tunica vaginalis is uh, it is a pri it is a peritoneal cavity, so that's kind of strange. All right, let's see here. Yep, and so that, as we said, that becomes the cavity for the tunica vaginalis. It has an outer layer 
where the parent is, the parietal tunica vaginalis, and an inner layer called the visceral tunica vaginalis. And here's a new picture. We can make that more correct. So this has scarred shut. That was the tunica vaginalis, or the um, processus vaginalis, or vaginal process. It's gone. And then we have a cavity right here. And so that's the cavity for the tunica vaginalis, or the tunica vaginalis cavity, or whatever you want to call it. Call it one of those. And again, this is just really the the old processus vaginalis, which is turned into the cav the tunica vaginalis cavity. Got it? It's not that hard, is it? Um, now we haven't talked about. Remember, there's a vas deferens that is pulled down here. I haven't. I just assume you know the vas deferens is part of the testes. That's pulled down when the testes come down as well. It doesn't have any, it doesn't help the testes descend or anything like that. But yeah, so there's a nice cavity for tunica vaginalis cavity. Right? And what's left is this little thin cord. Um, and that's just the ligament now of the, the vaginal process or ligament remnant of the processus vaginalis is usually inside the uh, spermatic cord as well. There's the vas deferens. All right, we don't need to go through these parts right now. Um, but we do need to go through these layers. Uh, so the inguinal canal and the spermatic cord. What's the story with the inguinal canal and the spermatic cord? Inguinal canal and spermatic cord was created embryologically via the descent of the processus vaginalis and glubernaculum and testes. Yep. Therefore, the inguinal canal has the same layers as the spermatic cord. Yeah, it does. I mean, it is the spermatic cord, really. Um, and the testes, too. But remember, the testes is missing one layer, though. What do you mean? How can the testes be missing? Well, this is the testes, and so this was the old parietal peritoneum right here, the old parietal peritoneal. So, uh, but I mean, it is covered in a way. It's not completely covered by the old parietal peritoneum, but anyway. Um, so the external oblique, as the spermatic cord and the inguinal canal and the spermatic cord, or and uh, the testes as they're pulled through the lower abdominal wall, they take the the aponeurosis of the external oblique with them and that goes all the way down to the testes and it gets renamed it's called the external spermatic fascia i'll show you a picture in a second the internal oblique muscle and fascia turns into cremasteric fascia and muscle the internal spermatic fascia turns into transversalis fascia right does not contain parietal peritoneum though the inguinal canal because it dried up so let's go back to our picture so, inguinal canal, I mean, this would be the inguinal canal. It's like really, really big here. But it takes all the layers, but not this, because this is now dried up. Let's look at a picture. All right, so this is a pretty good picture. We're missing the um, preperitoneal fat layer, is the only one they forgot to put in here. And that goes all the way down as well. But let's look. Uh, so, let's look at the testes descent. Um, so, and and here's the spermatic cord, and spermatic cord is inside the inguinal canal. They're the same layers, and you, they're all around the testes as well. And so here's all the layers of the abdominal wall. Uh, so the blue layer is the transversalis fascia. Well, let's start up here. So this is the visceral peritoneum, or sorry, the parietal peritoneum here. Um, and it used to go all the way down, right? But it, it dried up, so it doesn't count anymore. Originally, it went down, but because uh, it dried up, it's no longer... And it was never completely around the testes, so we don't say that's a member uh, of, the, of the spermatic cord or inguinal canal or testes. It's not around the testes, even though technically it kind of is. You say it's not. Because they say it ends right here. It doesn't go down into the inguinal canal. Everything else goes through the ingu inguinal canal and spermatic cord. So this is transversalis fascia, 
was pulled down and that's the very inner layer uh, of the uh, of the scrotum and it also lines the inguinal canal and the spermatic cord right the next layer there should be a layer of preperitoneal fat which you will see on other that's, I shouldn't have made it blue uh, but that also goes down here uh, so there's a little fatty substance that surrounds this as well that was not drawn uh, and then we just work our way down transverse abdom transversus abdominis that now this is the weird one transversus abdominis is the only one that doesn't go down see how it dead ends here so transverse abdominis and the uh, the parietal layer of the peritoneum that doesn't go down uh, but the other layers do so the next layer down is the internal oblique aponeurosa that's taken down and the external oblique aponeurosa that is taken down as well um, and so is the fascia is taken down scarpus fascia and skin is also taken down uh, inside of here or skin that's um, yeah because there's skin of course around your scrotum okay so confusing make sure you know that here's just another picture of the same thing a little bit better drawn but you can see how the the author the parietal peritoneum did not go down at all so that that is still there now it has holes through it uh, where the vastus deferens the ductus deferens goes through we have all the nerves and the uh, the testicular arteries and veins they rip through the parietal peritoneum but it doesn't go down into the canal or become part of the spermatic cord see how that works um, and you can also see what else can we see here there's the uh, the preperitoneal fat layer would be right here see how the fat goes down as well that other drawing the author forgot to put that in there uh, transversalis fascia uh, that goes down in green right transversus abdominis doesn't see how it stops right there doesn't go down internal oblique muscle and aponeurosa goes down becomes cream asteric uh, fascia and muscle and there's the external oblique fascia that's the outer layer of the spermatic cord and the inguinal ligament got it and those same layers they just they change names there's the external spermatic fascia that was the fascia for the external oblique uh, the next layer down becomes cream asteric and then internal spermatic fascia but those are just those same layers we saw up here right transversalis fascia external oblique internal oblique transversus abdominis doesn't get to play the game though for whatever reason it doesn't go down okay we already went over that there's just again kind of that bird's eye view if you're inside the abdominal cavity and looking out p to a view um, so we can see the the internal or deep inguinal ring right here transversalis fascia is kind of lipped on the outside here and the superficial inguinal ring would be deep into the plane of the page but it would be right here at the kind of corner of Hesselbeck's triangle we went over these borders so I'm not gonna do that again all right so now let's get into we said 25 percent of people have a persistent processus vaginalis or persistent vaginal process so what kind of deal what kind of problems are we going to have you can imagine the problems we're going to have with that right so the process is vaginalis never scarred shut so you have a communication between your peritoneal cavity and your uh, in your testes right it's inside the the testes but it's really not I mean you have to read see what the question technically speaking the communication is between the peritoneal cavity and the cavity for the tunica vaginalis right because that's what that distal part of the process this vaginalis becomes that cavity that mostly surrounds the testes but not completely surrounds the testes all right and what else do we need to say here yeah it can be the the process is vaginalis as we said before it can be completely open or it can be partially opened 
And here is a person who has a fully developed scrotum. Testes are down in the scrotum. And you can see we have a open processus vaginalis. And the author should have made the, the little blue peritoneal cavity dripping down into there. So there's the cavity for the tunica vaginalis. Now has peritoneal fluid. Plus, this, these, the tunics here secrete serous fluid, just like the pericardial cavity and the pleural cavity, peritoneal cavity. They secrete fluid, so you have a little serous fluid down here as well, mixing with the other peritoneal fluid, which is still serous fluid. All right, so peritoneal fluid can get down there, but the bad thing is intestine can make their way through there because now it's really easy for intestine to get down in there. Uh, and that's the definition of an indirect inguinal hernia. Right? We said females can have these, these indirect inguinal hernias, but they don't have a scrotum or testes. They can still get a little ball down by their, uh, where the hair is there, the mons pubis, by the labia majora. It can go all the way to the labia majora. So they they can also get inguinal hernias. They just are not as devastating usually uh, as God. And I shouldn't say devastating. They're most they usually don't kill you. They hurt. They have to be surgically repaired. But every now and then they they can be fatal if they if the intestine becomes incarcerated. You can get into big trouble. But what's the epididy uh, the epididy epididymis? I was going to say the epidemiology uh, is found in about twenty percent. 26% according to this author. The other author said 24. But about, about a quarter of humans have some degree of, of open vaginal process or processus vaginalis. 20% of these people who have them uh, become symptomatic with at least a hydrocele. may not be painful, but they start getting swelling in their testes. Um, or they could end up at some point in their life with a full direct or indirect inguinal hernia and need surgery. Some fun facts. So if you have one on one side, there's about an 85% chance it's on the other side. Um, so only about 11% get bilateral hernias, though. So even though uh, you probably have both processes, vaginalis is opened up, you only 11% get bilateral hernias through there. It gets too tight. If one hernia intestine herniates down through there, it kind of blocks the other uh, the other from having intestine go down in. Hernia or hydrocele. So, yep. Yeah. So if it's a small, maybe if it's only partially open, the process is vaginalis. It's too small for intestine to get through, but you can get accumulation of fluid uh, called the hydrocele. That's just testy. That's just a, a ball of fluid in your scrotum or around your labia majora if you're a female. If it's a full, wide open process, it's vaginalis. You'll have a fluid. You'll have a hydrocele to some degree. But the scary thing then is you can have intestines move down and get stuck in there. So, now that we know, let's officially talk about this indirect ingual hernia. We already know a lot about it. It's the most common type of groin hernia. 75% of all groin hernias are indirect inguinal hernia. Way more common in men. It occurs, as we know, when the intestine moves through the deep inguinal ring and gets stuck. And it might go all the way down into the, through the superficial ring, all the way down into the, scro uh, into the scrotum. And it moves through a persistent processus vaginalis. The processus vaginalis is inside the inguinal canal. And inside the inguinal canal is the spermatic cord. So this hernia is inside all of those structures. These are, because this is a congenital problem, happens at birth. It's a failure of the processus vaginalis to close and you're born with it. They're considered by some congenital hernias. Uh, they can be seen in, well, they can be seen in any any age, but they're typically caught in babies after they're born in children. Uh, and again, as I said, the hernia sac, because it does have a hernia sac. What's the innermost layer of the hernia sac in this part? Well, it would, it would be parietal peritoneum or parietal peritoneum. That would be the innermost layer of the hernia sac. Uh, but 
the hernia sac is inside the inguinal canal. Yeah, everything's inside the inguinal canal. The spermatic cord is inside the inguinal canal. Uh, what's the difference between the inguinal canal and the spermatic cord? Well, the inguinal canal also has uh, some muscle boundaries that the spermatic cord doesn't have. Hernia sac may keep right and going, as we said, go all the way into the scrotum or into the labia majora. Um, so what are the layers of the hernia sac in an indirect? That's a good question. What are the layers of the hernia sac in a small bowel hernia or indirect inguinal hernia? What are the layers of that sac? Uh, well, parietal peritoneum, because the, it's a, a persistent process of vaginalis, so it has per it's p the the process is vaginalis is lined with parietal peritoneum already, so that would be the uh, considered the the outermost layer of the sac, and then visceral peritoneum around the intestine. Remember, the intestines are surrounded with visceral peritoneum, and then just the rest of the layers that form the spermatic cord. All right, so here's a good picture showing that parietal peritoneum is taken right down with it. Normally it's sealed up here except for those little holes where the where the vast deference goes through. But so that's the innermost layer is this parietal peritoneum. Uh, then we have extra peritoneal fat, but that's part that's there anyway. That's part of the spermatic cord. And then the rest of the layers I won't go through them. But remember again, here's where I'm gonna get you guys Notice transversus abdominis muscle and the aponeurosa does not play the game. It doesn't go down. Got it? But that's not true of internal oblique. That does send fascia or muscle down and becomes a cremasteric muscle. Internal oblique sends fascia down. Uh, or I'm sorry, we did um, internal oblique becomes cremasteric. We forgot to do the transversus, uh, what do we forget? Oh, transversalis fascia we forgot. So that's that next layer. Transversalis fascia is that little, I don't know what color that is, gray. Okay, so I went through that before so you get the idea. That's a nice picture though. All right, let's look at some of these. So there's the inguinal ligament. These are definitely below, so these are not direct inguinal hernias. Um, so this is a hydrocele as well. There's fluid in there. Uh, but there's also intestine that's gotten in there as well. So that's not good. All right, just another picture of intestine, how it's worked its way down uh, through the spermatic cord, through the inguinal canal. All right, I think we got it. Uh, here's female, so the volvula would be down here. Uh, her head would be up here, her belly's here, and she comes into the dock. Got a big bulge here, Doc. What's going on? There's the mons pubis starting. Kind of a weird looking picture. Uh, but yep, so that's an indirect inguinal hernia in a female. And so their the process is vaginalis because they didn't have testes pulling down there. It's, it's more narrow than males anyway. So it doesn't tend to happen. If it does happen, if they have a persistent process is vaginalis, that is given a special name it's called, some authors call it the canal of nook, like Dr. Nook, right? The canal of nook. And uh, yeah, so that's the lumen for the process, uh, persistent processes vaginalis. That's from standering, so that could be a board question. And yep, region, um, yeah, we, we know that. Now a large process is vaginalis, they could get not only intestines, but the uterus, the fallopian tube, and the ovary can get sucked down into there as well. Okay, what about, this is from Standering, a board book as well. That's the big, thick, black, gray's anatomy book. That's huge, uh, Standering. So she breaks them down into complete versus incomplete, so you should know that. It could show up on boards. So when the, the hernia sac ends up all the way in the scrotum, or all the way down to the mons pubis. Those are called complete congenital indirect inguinal hernias, or sometimes just complete inguinal hernias. So some board questions could pop up like that, complete inguinal hernia. And then incomplete would mean it doesn't go all the way. It's still in the, uh, in the inguinal canal. 
right? So there's an incomplete congenital uh, indirect. That actually looks like a direct inguinal hernia to me, right? Because it's above, there's the inguinal ligament. Uh, they're typically more in this region, so I don't think that's, I think that's a direct inguinal hernia. Uh, strangulated. What's the story with that? St so in indirect inguinal hernias, they're, da they're more dangerous because that's a tight squeeze for you to have intestines going all the way down into your inguinal canal and even all the way into your scrotum. So fecal material can get blocked and that can cause a small bowel obstruction or a mechanical obstruction, which results in a strangulation. And that is a strangulated indirect inguinal hernia is one of the most common emergency surgical procedures uh, on the planet. <coughs> All right. And it is one of the most common causes of intestinal obstruction in all ages. And yeah, if you get intestines uh, pushing down through the inguinal canal uh, and into the spermatic cord itself, it can strangle these blood vessels. And you can get, uh, you can lose your testicle because that's where the blood, there's the testicular artery in red. So you can lose that. And um, that's not good. That's called testicular ischemia. That's severe, severe pain in the testicles. You'll rush into the hospital, and that's usually what happens is you've got an indirect inguinal hernia. All right, so that's enough for this morning. Uh, we will do part two. I'll post that one separately. I'm sorry, virtual classroom failed on us this morning, so this one will be on YouTube. See you later.